1983, members of a hacking group known as the Inner Circle, as well as other hackers, had gained access to various computer systems on networks across the US. These teen hackers were using the systems they accessed to chat amongst themselves and explore for bragging rights. But they didn't know the FBI was about to come knocking. This is part one of the history of the Inner Circle. In the United States in 1983, there were two big hacker group busts. The first was in July, a group of Milwaukee high schoolers known as the 414s. The resulting FBI investigation and the identification of the youths involved generated intense media attention. Three months after the 414s were raided, there was a second, huge, ongoing FBI hack investigation and impending nationwide raids of hacker groups, named the Inner Circle and the Falsers. This second FBI inquiry was in many ways more significant than that of the 414s in terms of hacker history, but it doesn't even appear on many timelines on the topic. This video will focus mainly on the inner circle, but will of course discuss the falsers and other random hackers caught up in the Fed's dragnet along the way. In this first video we're going to look at what was hacked and how, then in the second video we'll examine the ways in which the hackers involved were caught and what happened next. In both videos, I'll be pulling in information from media reports from the time and hundreds of pages of FBI documents relating to the Inner Circle, released to me under the Freedom of Information Act. Before we discuss the Inner Circle, I should clarify that we are talking about the Inner Circle as the US hacker group that existed in 1983. There was a first, smaller iteration of the group that had some membership overlap with the version we are discussing here. Members included Wizard of Arpanet, Shockwave Rider, and Satan Knight, also known as Red Rum. There was also a BBS named Inner Circle in California that might be related, and a Wares group in the 90s that is probably completely unrelated. Inner Circle is a popular group name as it turns out. Wizard of Arpanet listed the membership in the group circa 1983 in a frag scene profile he did in 1987 as having been himself, The Cracker, Mr. America, Napoleon Bonaparte, Stainless Steel Rat, Big Brother, Mr. Xerox, Bootleg, Maxwell Wilkie, Mandrake the Magician, and Zaphod Beeblebrox. For context, Frack is an extremely popular and long-lived hacker easing that has been going steadily since 1985. If you are interested in US hacker history especially, you want to look to Frack. We know from details of the FBI raids that members were spread out across the country in California, Michigan, New Jersey, Arizona, Oklahoma, and Virginia. Although hackers who were unaffiliated and members of other groups were also swept up in the investigation. From everything I've read, the leader of Inner Circle was Wizard of Arpanet, who I'll be calling Wizard from here on in. And this video relies on his contemporaneous accounts of the group, as well as the Cracker's 1985 book, Out of the Inner Circle, as a counterbalance information gleaned from FBI FOIA files. Wizard was from Detroit, Michigan, which became a focal point of the FBI investigation early on, and the Cracker was from San Diego. From the FBI files dubbed Operation Mainframe by the agents involved and newspaper coverage of the raids, we know the Inner Circle was entirely made up of high school age boys. In June of 1983, a member of another group called the 414s had inadvertently helped reveal that group's hacking exploits. A systems administrator of Sloan Kettering Cancer Center's medical physics computer service discovered to his astonishment that a digital vax computer, which monitored radiation treatment for 250 patients, had inexplicably failed overnight. A member of the 414s had deleted files and reset passwords on the machine and had caused various system errors that had resulted in a complete crash. In his book, Out of the Inner Circle, Cracker discussed some of the rules the Inner Circle tried to enforce on members and compared the way that group behaved with the way the 414s had treated some of the systems they had accessed. No Inner Circle member will ever delete or damage information that belongs to a legitimate user of the system in any way that the member cannot easily correct himself. No member will leave another hacker's name or phone number on any computer system. He will leave his own on a system only at his own risk. All members are expected to obtain and contribute their own account information rather than use only information given to them by other members. So while the Inner Circle members and other affiliated hackers knew each other initially from hacker BBSs or already real life friends, where they wound up was a nationwide US commercial network called GTE Talonet. It's at this point that we need to discuss the basic functional motivations of hackers in the early 80s. I don't mean why they hacked, that is more personal, I mean more the ways in which they achieved their goals. With the advent of cheaper personal computers in the 80s, freaking, the art of manipulating the phone system, became more about practicalities than exploration for many. With no cheap or easily accessible equivalent to the internet as we know it today, a lot of social interaction for early home computer users was conducted via BBSs. A bulletin board system, or BBS, is a single computer running software that allows users to connect to the system using a dial-up terminal program and a modem. BBS users could then perform functions such as uploading and downloading software and data, 
reading news and bulletins and exchanging messages with other users through message boards, or sometimes via direct chats. BBSs were where a lot of hackers of this year exchanged information, learned new hacking techniques, made friends, impressed their competition, started feuds and of course relentlessly chased clout. Hacker BBSs often had rules governing who could join and had their own hierarchies, from the sysop who owned and ran the system the BBS resided on, to password protected areas for special VIPs. These BBSs frequently had separate boards to discuss freaking and hacking, with anarchy, bomb making and practical jokes mostly, viruses and carding also hot topics. Dialing a BBS in your own area might not be expensive, but what if you wanted to call a BBS on the other side of the country, because that's where the most elite hackers were conducting their business? This is where telephone toll fraud enters the picture. Teenagers who feared their parents' wrath over long distance charges could simply avoid paying for calls through various techniques and tricks. We'll get onto a related topic, war dialing, demon dialing or hammer dialing as it was also known, later in this episode when we discuss hacking techniques of the time in some more detail. In 1983 there were already software piracy collectives, a flourishing underground BBS community, a decades long established phone freaking scene, and thriving nationwide hacking groups in the US. The 414's hacking group eclipsed Inner Circle in the media it seems, as they were busted before Inner Circle were caught, and closer to the release of the movie War Games, which captured imaginations at the time. Neil Patrick of the 414's was featured on the cover of Newsweek, on Donahue, which was America's most respected talk show at the time, on Good Morning America, in People magazine, and in other publications too numerous to list. I think that is why you remember the 414's more than the Inner Circle. The 414's also seem to be a lot more willing to talk to the media. No way that you can really say exactly how many computer programs we access. It felt like it kept kind of snowballing. The Today Show, CBS Morning News, Somebody CNN's Crossfire. Right. All that was modified was an accounting file that the doctors used for billing their time on the computer. A bunch of kids in Wisconsin started racing the doctor's bills. <laughs> <laughs> the newspapers latched on to the fact that members of the 414s had all watched the movie War Games, which came out in June. The 414s were raided in August. Similar links were made between kids caught up in the Inner Circle raids and that particular movie. When the FBI searched the homes of suspects in the Inner Circle Telenet intrusion, they found issues of TAP magazine. TAP had grown out of the early 70s Youth International Party Line publication by the Yippies, which included information on how to beat the man, frequently the man being the phone company. TAP was to wrap up publication in 1984, having been published for 11 years at that point, making way for 2600 as its spiritual successor. Speaking of 2600, the Falsers gang, aka Freakers, Hackers and Laundromat service employees who were involved in Telenet hacking around the same time as Inner Circle and some of whom were raided during the FBI's Operation Mainframe investigation, are deeply entwined with the founding of 2600 magazine in 1984. The first issue of 2600 featured extensive reporting on the raids and background information on an FBI informant who we will be covering in part 2. Meanwhile in California around the time that the Inner Circle were active there were a few separate significant hacker related incidents. On September 22nd of 1983, the FBI swooped in on Kevin Polson and Ron Austin's homes for various computer intrusions in the US and Norway, at universities, businesses and military bases. While Polson was never charged, although his computer was seized, Austin was hit with 14 counts of malicious access. By this time, Roscoe of the Roscoe Gang had already been sentenced to 150 days in jail in June of 1982 for phone freaking and computer intrusions related to the phone company Pacific Telephone. Susan Thunder, a California-based phone freak and member of the Roscoe Gang, testified to a House subcommittee in October of 1983 and described hacker wars and internal strife caused by the drive fellow hackers had to outdo each other in terms of hacking prowess and conquests of systems. California was an absolute hotbed of hacker activity in the early 80s and was one major focal point of the raids relating to the inner circle. In 1983 it is estimated there were about 10 million computers in use in the US. Computers back then cost hundreds or even thousands of dollars and most kids just wouldn't have had access to them. Back to the inner circle though. To understand what these hackers were up to, we first need to understand the GTE Telenet network. In their documentation of the Inner Circle case in 1983, the FBI described Telenet as a computer network which links various subscriber companies and government agencies through a tie-in system in various cities. Telenet was created by former ARPANET developers as a sort of civilian version of ARPANET. ARPANET itself being a computerized network created by the US Department of Defense in the 60s. Telenet went into service in 1975 as the first national licensed public data network in the US. The founding company, Telenet Incorporated, was acquired by GTE, formerly known as General Telephone and Electronics Corporation, in 1979. GTE then acquired Sprint and merged Telenet and Sprint Link in 1983. Users would dial their local Telenet access number, originally operating in only seven major US cities like LA, Chicago and New York, with their modem, 
and from there they could connect to a specific Telenet connected computer system remotely, check their email inboxes and similar basic functions. On a typical day, companies transmit about 50 million packets of computer information over the Telenet data network, which is the equivalent of over a million typewritten pages. You see, Telenet helps many of the top companies manage vital information. Everything from inventories to financial records. Imagine sending this much information in a day without an error. Gee. We've already discussed BBSs as a way for hackers to socialize. Telenet though, because of its local number access and many area codes across the US, and having message board and email capabilities, became an extremely tempting target for hackers. Once a few hackers became aware of Telenet and gained a foothold on systems, they were joined by many others. Once again, from the FBI's mainframe case documentation, the intruders, some of whom have banded together in groups known as Inner Circle and Operation Circle, have gained access to certain subscribers' computers by determining passwords assigned to subscriber administrators and establishing pirate bulletin boards within the subscriber system, as well as browsing through subscriber files. A follow-up in the same file goes on. On late afternoon, 25th of August, 1983, GTE advised Alexandria FBI office that a further review of their system has uncovered other intruders not previously discernible to GTE, which indicated this intrusion problem is far more widespread than previously thought. GTE is making a concerted effort to write a program into the system that will allow for a 24-hour day live monitor on accounts known to be accessed by members of the circle groups. The inner circle and related hackers would actually have been the third time school kid groups hacked Telenet and were caught in only a three-year time span. In 1981, a group of 13-year-old school children at New York's private Dalton School in Manhattan were caught after a combined FBI and Royal Canadian Mounted Police investigation. The kids have been accessing and damaging Canadian businesses' computers in Ottawa and Montreal after having connected via modem to a Telenet access number from their school's computer lab. Due to their age and a total lack of laws governing computer crimes at the time, no charges were ever pressed. In 1982 and 1983, the 414's hacker group had been able to trespass and wander through various systems connected to Telenet. They were eventually busted by the FBI in late July of 1983. After the 414's were apprehended, a spokesman for GTE Telenet described hacking as like the skyjacking phenomenon, people are going to try what other people are getting away with. This was mere months before Telenet admins became aware of intrusions by Inner Circle, the Falsers, as well as other hackers, and notified the FBI. I pulled together a list that is by no means exhaustive of companies, colleges, universities, and government agencies that were compromised in some way by hackers swept up in the operation codenamed Mainframe by the feds. This is according to the media of the time and the FBI's own records. Not all of these will have had machines directly compromised. In some cases, it would have been simply Telenet mail services or similar. Having said that, the list is still long and impressive. It includes various ARPANET hosts, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, NASA, Michigan National Bank, McClellan Air Force Base, Hartford College, Arizona State University, the MITRE Corporation, the National Institutes of Health, CompuServe, TimeNet, JCPenney's, everyone's favorite bomb manufacturer Raytheon, CreditLink, Sears Credit Line, Union Oil, and the Credit Bureau TRW, which I believe is now known as Experian. We'll look at estimated damages from all of this in the second part of this video. We've discussed the inner circle and their targeting of the Telenet network. We haven't really gotten deep into general hacking techniques, circa 1983. We know that some systems were compromised because modem numbers to access them were discovered by hackers. How do you find modem numbers to dial into systems though? War dialing is the process of dialing random phone numbers for the purpose of finding numbers that connect to modems on the other end. Way back in the day, this was done manually, but programs were created that automated this process. Social engineering is a term used to describe social interactions that rely on psychological manipulation to trick targeted people into making security mistakes or giving away sensitive information. Think smooth-talking con artist or carnival barker. Hackers could, and still do, persuade people to reveal information like modem numbers, usernames and passwords over the phone by pretending to be someone in authority. Once you found a system to access, a great technique to actually get on that computer was good old-fashioned password guessing. Telenet Telemail users were often initially assigned a password that was either just the letter A or their username followed by a capital A. When people did bother to change this password, which they were encouraged but not required to do, they would frequently choose something very simple to guess, like their first name instead. In hacker circles, this used to be known as a Joe user, a user called Joe who would then choose Joe as his password. Default system accounts on servers of this era often had default passwords and those username and password combinations were often documented in manuals that hackers could get their hands on. If admins were lazy about changing passwords or did not bother to check what accounts were set up as default on their systems, these accounts were an easy way in. There was also dumpster diving or garbology as Susan Thunder called it. I've covered that in episode 5 so check that out if you haven't already. 
Lastly, we have calling card codes. If you aren't familiar with calling cards, they're basically prepaid debit cards used to pay for long distance or international calls. Stolen card numbers can be used to place calls that would otherwise be prohibitively expensive. The FBI's mainframe file notes of their suspects. They routinely use stolen Sprint or MCI long distance codes. So we have dozens of hackers arranged both as individual actors and in multiple groups delving deep into the Telenet network and the systems associated with it. Because of the FBI FOIA documents, we know that there was a certain amount of tension between the groups and individuals over who to give access to and what was and wasn't acceptable to do with that access. It is the morning of October 11th, 1983, and a teenage hacker in Nebraska is about to become the first person raided by the FBI as part of Operation Mainframe. Raids that would continue for weeks afterwards until the eventual apprehension of the cracker. When I think about what was to come next, I think about the FBI's documentation of evidence seized that included a note taken from one teenager's room from his father. It read, Hi boys, you told me about your ability to access other computers with the phone, and right after you left, those computer raiding stories developed. Some of those kids could get into a lot of trouble. I hope you two are using good judgment and not doing that type of thing. Think. I know you will. Love, Dad. Before part two of the Inner Circle story, we are covering 1995 techno thriller The Net, after a vote by followers on Twitter and Mastodon. After we discuss The Net, I'll detail the multiple points in favor of the Inner Circle, Falsers, and others, having reasons to be optimistic that they wouldn't get busted, versus the reasons why their downfall was almost a certainty from their very first incursion onto Telenet. If you've enjoyed this video and don't want to miss future content, please subscribe. Likes are very much appreciated too. Our whole world is sitting there on a computer. It's in the computer. Everything, your, your DMV records, your, your social security, your credit cards, your medical history, it's all right there. Everyone is stored and there's like this little electronic shadow on each and every one of us just just begging for somebody to screw with and you know what they've done it to me and you know what they're gonna do it to you <laughs>